Hi, I'm Greg Howlett, and I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about arranging, the process of arranging, which is one of my favorite things to do. Now, I've been arranging now for about 25 years, but I've never yet stumbled on a system that really will help anybody arrange songs. But this course teaches one of those systems. It's a system I've developed over the past several years as I've had to work through arranging, arrangement after arrangement, and hopefully it'll be of help to you as well. It's a seven-step process, and it's holistic. Now, here's what I mean when I say holistic. Pianists have the ability to communicate through their arrangements, but the reality is we communicate on a big level. We communicate at a high level. Now, when you do an arrangement, you're telling a story, and the story can be very, very powerful, but most of the story occurs at a high level. In other words, you can't communicate words through notes. Some people may say you can, but they're wrong. You can't. You can communicate big ideas through arrangement, though. And that's what this course talks about for a long time. As a matter of fact, I don't even play for a long time as we go through the course because I want you to understand that. Arranging is storytelling. The storytelling happens at the high level. So that's why we talk about concepts like shape. And I want to show you a clip from the course where I talk about shape. Shape refers to what does the song look like in terms of the way it moves dynamically, the way it work, moves with tempo and articulation and other things through the arrangement. The way a song moves is a very, very big, important aspect of the story it tells. In other words, some songs may start slow and get fast. Some songs may start soft and get loud or in loud. When I talk about shape, shape sort of refers to um, that concept, but you can actually see that. For example, on the, um, the screen behind me, you see a song when it's broken into audio waves, and you can sort of look at that song and see where the highs and the lows are. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about when we talk about shape. Shape is a very, very important thing in regards to the story a song tells. So watch this clip to get a little more idea of that. We're going to get down to nitty gritty details later in terms of how you're going to play various um, pieces of the song. But the first thing you have to decide is what do you want the song to look like? There's all kinds of different shapes that are popular. For example, one very, very popular shape is to start a song slow and quiet and build and build, keep repeating until you have some huge, massive um, ending. And uh, we've all seen those. As a matter of fact, if you pick up a typical arrangement book, you're going to see um, those kind of songs in, in, that, in that hymnal or in that book. Now, there's a reason why that's such a popular shape. That happens to be a shape that has a big emotional impact. If you ever go to a concert, very likely the last song at the concert is going to be a song that's shaped that way. Uh, it's going to be a song that started, I'm thinking, oh goodness. I could start naming songs, but you know what I mean. You know exactly what I mean. There's, there's just songs, I call them goosebump songs. They're going to move the listener higher and higher on an emotional level, and then you have a huge ending. There's other shapes that are popular as well. For example, sometimes you'll see a shape, and I like this shape personally. It'll start quiet, and it'll build to a climax, but then it ends quiet. And that has a slightly different impact on a listener. All right, once you've settled on a shape, that's step two of the process, we then talk about form. Form refers to the verses and choruses and the order of the verses and choruses, how many transitions, interludes, endings, intros. These are things that all factor into the form of the song, which, of course, impacts the length of the song. The form should support the shape that you decided on in the, in the uh, step before. The form is important. Walk through this little clip with me where I talk about how you would come up with an arrangement and talk about the form in regards to how an arrangement is built. Notice what we're going to do. We're going to walk through a form, coming up with a form based on the assumption that we want a three and a half minute arrangement, which happens to be 210 seconds. Now here's what you want to do. First of all, make sure that you're keeping the shape in, in mind. Now I have here, I have a shape that's going to start soft and build to a huge climax. That's going to be the shape of the song and we want it to last 210 seconds. Now when I say 210, I mean anywhere from 190 to 240 or whatever. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be anywhere near exact. But you're going to try to shoot for around three and a half minutes. Now first thing you do is measure how long it takes, time yourself, how long does it take to get to a verse? 
how long does it take to get through a chorus? Let's say in this example that it takes 30, 30 seconds roughly to play the verse and 20 seconds to play the chorus okay, in a typical song, if there is a chorus. All right, so now you're getting an idea of how many times you're going to have to play this song to fill up 210 seconds. Um, in this case, now what I've done here is I've sort of put a form together that would work. And by the way, I'm keeping the shape of the song in mind as well. So I say here I'm going to play a 30-minute intro. It's going to be quiet and sparse. That fits the shape. The shape is going to start slow and build. Then we're going to move into the first verse. It'll still be quiet and sparse, the chorus. Now we're, that's 50 seconds plus 30 is 80. And then we're going to repeat the chorus, but now we need to start thinking about adding more movement. We're going to start building toward a climax. So something has to start happening to move you in the right direction. All right, so let's jump ahead a few steps of the process to the, pro to the concept of hooks. Now when I say hooks, I'm referring to a unifying theme that ties an arrangement together. Now here's the problem. In the years I've been arranging and listened to arrangements, I've seen one thing over and over again. It's a big pet peeve of mine, and that's the fact that normally, well not normally, but most of us, when we arrange, what we do is we come up with a bunch of ideas and just sort of cram them together. It feels sort of like a theme and variations. It doesn't really feel well. It doesn't feel coherent, um, like a cohesive, um, unified arrangement. A hook can be a melodic idea, it can be a chord progression, it can be a rhythm, but it can be something that you can use throughout the arrangement. Maybe you build on it, maybe you tweak it as you go through the arrangement, but it ties everything together. Here's a little clip where I discuss this very, very important concept in more detail. Now, on page five, the second example is another hook that I've recorded that you may recognize. This is a very simple one um, from the song, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Now, this would probably be a, a very, I don't know, it wouldn't be textbook by any means, but for me, it's probably textbook in regards to the way to use a hook throughout a whole song. As a matter of fact, one thing that's important to realize is you don't have to have a ton of um, technical fireworks in an arrangement to make it really, really nice. You just have to do some planning. And this song is a good example of that. Now, this My Jesus, I Love Thee is a simple song to start with. But um, this arrangement is very, very simple. There's nothing in this arrangement that most of you can't sight read. But all it does is to, to sort of tie everything together is I use a hook. And I want to show you how simple the hook is. This does not have to be hard. It's right here. It's these first two bars. And um, it sounds like this. That's all there is to it. Da, 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 da. And um, the chords are simple. We start on a one chord, we move to four over one, right? Four over one. Yeah, four over one, and then five over one. And uh, that's it, and then four over one. So it's just one, four, five chords, okay? So you don't have to use fancy chords. One over, one, one four, five. Um, but it's a simple little pattern that you can incorporate through the song. Now, I actually want to play this a little bit for you. I don't know if I'll play the whole thing. I don't know that I've played the whole thing in years. But um, I do want to show you how you can incorporate a simple little idea through a song and, and make it effective. As a matter of fact, for reasons I'll never understand, this is a popular song on that CD. I think it's the most downloaded song on iTunes from that album, My Jesus, I Love Thee, which to me is almost like, I don't say there's throwaway songs on a recording, but there, there are certainly songs that you put a lot of focus on versus ones that you just sort of put on there for diversity or whatever. And this isn't a song I, I spend a lot of time on, but if there's anything that probably makes it effective, it probably is the fact that it's got this little hook on it. Here's how I'd use it. Okay, that's your intro. Now I'm gonna start the verse. Notice how I'm incorporating that hook, same style of the hook, into the style of the first verse. Back to the hook. So I played a phrase and then I'm coming right back to the hook. Next phrase.
back to the hook. New idea. Actually, I play, should play it here. I tried to take it down an octave. Now I'm going to do the mod. Just play it again in a new key. I, there's a lot of things I could talk about here, um, but notice how the ideas sort of tie together anyway. Um, I'm playing simple stuff, then I sort of break, instead of just playing chords, I break open the chords and play them broken, but it still feels the same. And then the other thing that really gives unity is coming back to that hook. As a matter of fact, I won't play the whole, arra whole arrangement, but if I did, you see I come back to the um, hook again, and the, as a matter of fact, the song ends with the hook. Um, so that's just a sort of an idea, that's an important concept to grasp, this idea of unity and yet having diversity. Even in the diversity, there needs to be unity. All right, so moving on a step or two more, we come to the concept of technical treatments. Technical treatments refer to the technical things you do with the melody or a certain part of the song to make it interesting, to bring diversity to an arrangement. Now, many of you, when you think of arranging, this is the concept that you think about. For me, it's one of the last things I think about. There are things that are more important that happen at a bigger level, but these are important. You apply technical treatments to the skeleton that you've built to this point, the skeleton, the form, and the shape. And what we're going to do through this section is we're going to give you a toolkit, a toolkit that will help you come up with your own technical ideas. I think there's about an hour through this course where I just give you these technical treatments. Obviously, not all the possible technical treatments that you can use, but a great um, beginner, a pr I call it priming your pump, it hopefully will prime your pump and get you thinking in certain ways about how to come up with technical treatments, things that you can use through your arrangement to bring technical diversity to it. So here's a clip of that. All right, so we're going to move on now to step six, which is technical treatments. And um, many of you thought this is what I was going to cover when you bought the course. You probably thought I was going to focus on this, this one step. I want to reemphasize again, this is toward the end because this is actually not as important as the overall um, strategy for the song. We're going to get into nitty gritty stuff now, which is great and you need that and that's important. These are brush strokes on a, on a, on a, on a painting. But we still, just like an artist before they started a painting, they would know sort of where they're going. They're not focused on brush strokes. They have an overall strategy. And the same is true here. You have to have an overall strategy uh, for, for what you do rather than um, just focusing in on every, you know, some little technical thing that you do well. Um, so we focus on the big, big picture, but now we're going to come down. We've, we've come down. We've got a chart, hopefully, that we can play, a chart of chords. And we're going to start coming up with a, a set of treatments that you can play on those chords. And we're going to go through a lot of things here over the next hour, um, so bear with me. We're going to go through a set of things, then we're going to play an arrangement and demonstrate some things, and then we'll be done. Um, this is sort of a hard concept to teach, to be honest with you, and I'll tell you why. I can sit here for the next hour, two hours, three hours, and demonstrate one technical thing after another. But all I'll be doing is giving you a bunch of crutches, essentially, a bunch of ideas that you can use or not use. They're basically just ideas. They're, they're only, these are things that you can hopefully load into your toolbox. Um, but you got to understand two things. First of all, you have to learn how to actually apply them. You have to get in there and dig deep and learn how to use them in the music. And secondly, this is only never more than just priming the pump because the best ideas are going to come from you. You're going to come up with ideas that reflect you. You're going to necessarily, by necessity, the ideas you come up with will match your hands better than my hands. Um, you'll have things that you play better than me and vice versa. So I'm going to give you thoughts of things that I do, 
but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily the things that you should do in your music. So don't look at it that way. I'm not just giving you the end all of technical treatments you can use to flesh out these sections. I'm just giving you a priming of the pump so that you can go in and start playing on your own and doing some things. Now, again, let me explain what we're going to do. We came up with a chart, and you saw the chart on page 9. Okay, let's go back there just a second. Let me refresh, make sure we know where we are. This chart right here reflects all the decisions that we have made in the first several steps, right? The only thing that I don't have on here is the hook. Actually, I do have the hook. Um, in this song, the hook is moving from 1 to 4. That's the hook, and I'm going to show that to you later. But um, it doesn't have a melodic hook or something like that written in. But everything else we've decided is on this chart. We know the shape of the song. We have the form of the song. The form of this song is what? Intro, verse, chorus, mod, chorus, transition, verse, mod, chorus, ending. That's the shape of the song, or the form of the song. We have the shape of the song in things like this. We have some dynamic markings. We have um, retards, fermatas, um, crescendos and decrescendos, um, something that says more movement, those kind of things at a macro level. Now, we're not talking about every decrescendo on every measure or anything like that, but at a macro level, at a high level, the decisions that we've made up to this point are all here. Um, so we've got the shape, we've got the song, we've got the form of the song, we've got some ideas about the hook in here. Now, what we have to do now is we have to go in and start working on these sections one at a time and come up with a technical treatment that will work for each section, okay? And that is the point of this step. This is the step where we're going to go in and look at each one of these sections at a time. Now, you might, might want um, to, uh, as you go through this, again, document always, you're going to be documenting. You might want to work a section at a time, document it, go to the next section next, the next day. You may want to um, work on multiple sections in a day. It's up to you. The one thing I want to in, in for, uh, not enforce, but the one thing I want to emphasize is this. Everything we come up with still has to stay unified. So you can't just come in and, and do a, um, a technical treatment for this section and then come up with something just way off the wall, something really different here. We need to have a way to tie everything together. It all needs to feel like it belongs together. Now, that's a hard concept to get across, this idea of diversity and unity. But I want to start introducing it to you on page 10 and give you some thoughts. Okay? Now, on page 10, I have 10 bars of an F chord. You can see an F chord on every single one of these bars. As a matter of fact, the melody note is F, and we're playing an F chord. Okay? Now, if you've been through reharmonization, you recognize I'm throwing the 2 into that chord. It's not the 9 because there's no 7th, but there's the 2. But it's an F chord. It's just F. Okay? Now, we could start as simple as this. When you come to a bar of an F chord, you could play this, right? And hold it for 4 beats if you're in 4-4 four, four time. And there's a place for that. There certainly is a place for that. There's a place in your arrangements for music that's that simple, okay? I didn't put that example, but you could play an F chord as simple as that and just hold it. That's all I was doing. Now, I wasn't holding it for four beats a piece because the chords were changing faster than that. But that was just a, that's a very, very simple thing you do. However, we can play something like this. Two and three and four and how I'm playing that pattern through that measure. Now I'm not playing it perfectly. You're going to find that you're not going to be able to stick with exactly that unless you come to a place where you have four beats, where the melody note's not moving. But I, you can stick with a pattern like that. How do you develop from there where you still have unity but you have diversity? 
Well, you start developing on that pattern. Okay, let's go to the next example. What have we done here? We're still playing the same thing in the right hand, but in the left hand, we're going to introduce just a little bit of, um, of rhythm. Okay, so now we have this pattern. Something very, very simple, but you see how that creates movement. It's moving the song in a direction. You still feel some kind of, um, you still feel the unity, but you're also getting some diversity in there. Now, you obviously don't have to stop there. There's all kinds of things rhythmically you can do. And I just give you another example in the third, in the third bar. Um, just a slightly more sophisticated rhythm. Um, which you could use. By the way, obviously you want to make sure that whatever you choose works for the song. Remember that's an overriding um, rule of thumb here is that when you pick these treatments, they should match the shape of the song and they need to match, the shape of the song needs to match the message of the song. If it's a big song with a big message, then you pick treatments that will support the shape. The shape needs to support the overall message. Okay, so that's the course in a nutshell. This is a three hour course. And again, it's unique in that it presents a very solid seven step process for arranging. Now, notice I said a process. It's not the process. Everybody will have their own little tweaks. You certainly would be free to tweak the order or change the, the, the process around. But what I've noticed is I've worked with pianists is that many of them don't know how to get started arranging. And if you don't know how to get started arranging, this is a great starting point, a solid system that'll get you from picking a song to a polished arrangement.